So what is the methods? What is the, the, the challenge that when you are constructing your document, you are finalizing your thesis, you, you are, you are um, confronted to, to, to do. So today we are uh, receiving Andre Patrão, that he's a postdoc fellow at Yale University. He's online. Ha Hello. <laughs> Hello, Andre. Thank you for being here uh, virtually with us. And he will present a method in the making, process, product, and the personnel during a PhD. And also we have um, Valentin Bourdon, uh, that he is here with us. And he is a postdoc uh, researcher at Habitat Research Center at FFL. And he will, he will present it from object to methods. So today we have these two experiences, and uh, I um, hope that you give your questions to them and ask about how is this process, and uh, let's share this, uh, this, um, this experience uh, together this evening. So, um, Andre, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, having me there, uh, in a way. It's always good to be back at EPFL, even if in this uh, vi uh, virtual form. Uh, thank you so much, Ana Carla, Fi, Michaela, Helena, for setting up this this event. I hope so far you've been having an incredibly productive and stimulating day of uh, discussions, and that Valentine and I will be able to uh, add uh, our own contribution to that right now at the very end. Um, I have to say, it's um, I, I would of course prefer to be there with you. I'm. I don't think anyone misses Zoom, much less presenting on Zoom. And uh, also, I know how good the aperos are at the end of these events. So I, I'm tremendously jealous of what you're going to get afterwards. I find it tremendously unfair that I'm here talking to you and then I won't even get a drink or a snack or anything. But uh, I guess that makes up for all the times that uh, the situation was uh, in reverse. Well, uh, let's talk more seriously now. Uh, as Anna Carla said, uh, method is probably one of the most present, problematic, but sometimes elusive issues of the PhD. On the one hand, we're quite open about the fact that it is an issue. And at EPFL, you start your, uh, your PhDs with a compulsory seminar on methodology. So it's not a secret that method is an issue. But I'm not just here to talk about the, let's say, the procedural aspect of uh, method as a topic, as an abstract uh, subject of discussion, as a, a procedural process uh, item in your uh, PhD. I want to talk about the very personal impact that something like struggling with a me methodology has. Um, make no mistake, it's it can be something daunting. It can be something horrible, especially for something like uh, something as personal as a PhD thesis, and especially in a domain as uh, academia, that isn't exactly a nine to five job, but it's so personal all the time. So methodology can be a tremendous obstacle and yet a necessary one to overcome. So today I would like to talk um, about something that seems very pertinent at the end of the day, after you've presented your research results, the process um, through which you got to those results, and more than that, the process that led you to the process that led to that result. And now you can see that I do have a kind of philosophical background because I'm complicated thing, complicating things and formulating them um, in this uh, in this excessively convoluted way, but justified, and it will make sense. Uh, first, I want to present methodology as this problem, uh, what kind of problem we're talking about uh, beyond the strictly procedural uh, research-wise method. And second, share a few experiences uh, that helped me overcome methodological problems while doing my PhD at EPFL, but also one specific insight from someone else, from someone much wiser than me and much uh, far more philosophical, Ludwig Wittgenstein, one of the major philosophers of the 20th century. So let's get started and uh, with method as a problem. Uh, 
Now, it seems like it shouldn't be a problem. It's something basic and essential to uh, our research process. We, we need it to, to attain a certain outcome. And, um, and we assume that uh, we just pick up a certain kind of methodology, almost as a kind of algorithm into which you introduce data and the result will uh, eventually come out. It's not supposed to be an issue. It's supposed to be a means towards an end. And in this regard, I'm reminded of a very famous, uh, um, well, uh, very philosophically famous uh, example that uh, uh, Martin Heidegger gives of how tools work. Uh, when you're building a house, for example, and you pick up a hammer, you're not focused on the hammer. You're focused on what you're building, on what you're doing. You're building a house, you're a cabin, a bench, or whatever you're doing, nailing that, uh, um, uh, hammering that nail. That is your task. That's what you're aware of. And the hammer only performs its real task when you're completely oblivious to it, when it just allows you to attain that ultimate goal. This is how we often think about methodology, as if we had this toolbox and we're looking for the right tool to get us to that objective that we set. We want to discover this. We want insight on that. We're in this specific uh, disciplinary framework where the toolbox includes this, this, that, et cetera, et cetera. And we pick the right tools to employ to reach that goal, to produce that result. In your case, a PhD thesis. The problem is when the tool fails. And that's when it becomes obvious to us. And picking up on Heidegger again, he'll tell us, Sometimes there's something wrong with the hammer and it's not quite hammering as it should. And you look at it and try to figure out what's wrong. Maybe it's broken. It just doesn't perform its task. And you have to become aware of the hammer to overcome that problem, to fix your, the, the instrument you're using. Or maybe it's just not there. It's missing. So something instrumental like method can become incredibly obvious when it's not functioning as it should. And I think that in research, it, this can be especially devastating for, for many reasons. First of all, because it's something that's not supposed to happen. You, you have a certain timeline to accomplish your, your goal in your research. That is your aim. Figuring out what's wrong with the hammer is not part of your aim. It's a distraction. It's something that forces you to do something else that's not the main thing. And it's incredibly disruptive. It's almost like you know, being out of, elect out of electricity in your house or you want to take a train somewhere and the train is canceled. It's something that you assume that you take for granted that should just work. When it doesn't, it's not something that you can handle on the side. It immediately goes to the top of your priorities because there's nothing, nothing you can do without fixing that problem first. And how frustrating it is when you have the pressure of academia and the PhD and every second counts. Like this train example, when you're trying to figure out how you're gonna get to A to, from A to B without the train, you're not going anywhere, you're stuck, you're just there. How frustrating it is that you're wasting time doing something that is not your main point. So the breakdown of methodology, or better yet, the awareness of a problem of methodology can be a problem not just in the objective process of doing your research or of doing your PhD, but even in a very personal way of disrupting your life completely. So uh, I think this is especially problematic for PhD students because the PhD is the moment where you have this first encounter with method as a true problem, uh, as something that is not a given. You come from Say your, your master's, where uh, you have a series of courses, professors give you assignments, they suggest um, uh, methods to resolve the problems that they put before you, you assimilate these methods, and if you do it right, you get a good grade in the end, you got it, it's great, move on to the next uh, course. But suddenly with a PhD, you have this autonomy that is on the one hand a blessing because you can pursue your own goals, but also a curse, because this will not be given to you. The method is not just clear, it's not just there, it's not just handed out. Although in that spirit of a former master's student, deep down you sort of still expect it to be. And suddenly you find yourself in this situation where you've arrived at EPFL in this competitive uh, PhD program, you made it, you come with all these big dreams, the 
a huge project you, you come with that's going to revolutionize your field. And then you're stuck with absolutely basic questions. What am I even supposed to do? How am I supposed to begin? Uh, where am I supposed to begin? I start reading. Uh, what do I read? What do I make of what I'm reading? How far do I go? When do I stop reading? And uh, when do I visit the site? Should I have a site? What am I going to see in that site? Uh, do I go to the archives as well? How long do I spend there? How extensive will my research be? Uh, when do I start to write in the middle of all this? Because I have to produce a thesis. It's sooner, later. Uh, how do I write, actually? How do I write in a way that's understood? How do I write in a way that's helpful for me? What am I even supposed to say? What am I expected to say? What, what is relevant in my field? And here you are with all these ambitions of things that you're going to do to reach the very top of your field and you realize you hardly know how to walk. You're stuck with these fundamental, these very basic questions. So method is a problem, but I would point out that maybe a bigger problem is the way that we face that problem to begin with. That expectation that method will be a given, that it will be something that will simply do its job for you in a way. Uh, we think of the PhD as picking up that hammer and doing our, our job. Sometimes or often we forget, even if we deep down know, but throughout the process, we forget that part of the PhD is also learning how to build your own tools, how to build that hammer, how to build other kinds of instruments that will be useful for your work. In other words, method is not a given, but part of the process. It's not just the means, but it's also one of the ends. And it's part of this process that you're going through, which is not just writing a PhD thesis, but becoming PhDs, becoming doctors, having the skill of building your own method as well. So how do we go about doing this? Uh, easier said than done, right? Uh, well, I think two of the most frequent ways uh, we, we try to find a way out of the slump of methodology of method when it presents a, a problem, uh, and as I've experienced it in DPFL, is first talking. We talk to other people, to colleagues or supervisors exchanging experiences and difficulties and seeing how they resonate, find their own uh, way in this process. And second, shameful secret that, let's admit it, we've all tried to do it, do it, looking for that little hack, for that solution, for that absolute strategy or the, the trick or just the way that things are done. Certainly, surely there's got a way, there's got to be a way out there that if you just apply it, suddenly the PhD just becomes clear, suddenly it all unblocks and you can just write, write, write and it's gonna be superb, it's gotta be out there. And often when we're talking to other people using that first strategy, it's because we have an impression that they have that secret and we don't. And we're embarrassed of saying that actually we, we do not. Now, today I would like to do a little bit of both, but not in this kind of uh, a savior attitude of coming with a def definitive solution. I wish I had that. I don't think it's possible. I hope this doesn't disappoint you and doesn't make you think that you brought in the wrong guest. I would argue that if you had someone who said they had the solution for uh, how to fix methodology in a PhD, then you would have the, the wrong guest. Uh, instead, I would like to share some experiences of little things, some loose strategies that helped me in my process of um, not just doing the PhD, but afterwards of continuing doing research. And again, it doesn't come as uh, absolute guidelines or definitive ways that are sure to help you, but more of an exchange of experience. Some things might resonate with you. They might feel like oh yeah, if actually that's what I was looking for. Or maybe there are things that you already know, but it just feels good to hear someone else say it as well, to reassert your confidence in what you're doing. Or maybe it's completely different from what you're doing, but that tension is productive too. I come from a more theoretical, historical, and 
philosophical background. Of course, the things I'm going to say are probably more pertinent for people working in that field. It will be different from someone working in the hard sciences, for example. But I think that contrast should bring light into your own procedures as well. What is unique about what you do that is different from what other people do? So here are a, here's a very uh, loose list of a couple of things that helped. The first of all, the first of them, and perhaps the most obvious and too late to fix is get yourself a really good supervisor. Uh, uh, there's nothing you can do about it at this point. And I admit this is more of a pretext to thank my supervisor for the role uh, he had uh, in my uh, in my PhD. Christoph van Garraway uh, was a, a superb supervisor, uh, gave me all the autonomy I needed, but he was always there for the exact moment where I needed guidance, right place, the right time, with the right comment. Uh, it, it really is important to have a supervisor that understands how to make the most of your particular characteristics. And I am deeply indebted to uh, Christoph Van Garraway, as I'm sure many of you who have had contact with him in one form or the other uh, will be as well. Starting with more serious uh, um, feedback, though, there's one thing that I usually tell uh, my students that I find incredibly helpful when they're uh, writing uh, a paper or their master thesis, that their introduction or abstract should answer four fundamental questions. First of all, what are they talking about? What's the topic? What's the question? What's the issue they're addressing? Make it, make it clear from the start. Second, how are you going to address it? What's the process? What's the strategy? What's the outlook? What's the disciplinary framework that you're employing to engage that, uh, that topic of the many that you could have picked? Third, why does this topic even matter? Uh, why should a reader uh, care about it? There's so many other things you could be reading about, so many other lectures that you could be um, going to including at this moment. Why does this matter? Why should this matter for me in the audience and even for you as the one that's uh, writing or doing this work? And fourth, what will be the point? Uh, the, the what's are the, the hows are deeply methodological questions, uh, how to do it and uh, the, how it matters. Uh, so it ingrains the problem of method from the very start, the questioning of method, um, of selecting and building up that method. But then the what questions are guidelines. What is the point and what is the motivation to write about it? Those are anchors that help us uh, shape the method that we're going to select. Uh, this, let's say this tip leads to another one that I also find very useful, which is it, it, it presumes that the introduction or the abstract is something that you write over and over again. In fact, I would say it's the first and last thing that you write, including in a PhD. It's the first because it sets the your objective, your purpose. It's the first direction, a kind of guideline of where you're going. And it's the last thing because then it's the sum of the work you've accomplished. So it performs very different roles at different stages of your research. Third, this presupposes that you do not write things definitively when you're doing your PhD. Perhaps more so if you're, we're talking about um, theses that are written in a more communicative way because the real research is site, uh, site work or experiments, and then you're just communicating the results. But in something like in the humanities or theory specifically, writing is where the action happens. It's where the thinking occurs. And so there are multiple levels to that process of writing. You have to break it apart. Uh, think of something like painting. You don't paint like a printer does and just go line by line and it's done. Maybe you start with a general composition, then you, you refine the forms and there's a the color comes in. There are different issues that are dealing with building on previous steps and affecting them as well. So one image of how this writing process can go as well, it's terribly frustrating, but far more useful than just trying to write everything all at once. And fourth, to say that I'm sharing these points, not because I fully master them and I'm conveying my wisdom about them, but because they're really helpful 
as you go on too. This isn't just for students. This is just when you're doing your PhD. This is almost a kind of uh, a little creed that you get back to, you remind yourself of when you yourself are in a slump in, in your research, when you're overwhelmed with the amount of information you're dealing with or with problems in your research, sometimes these very simple uh, bullet points are guidelines to clarify what the problem is, what's missing. It doesn't mean that you have to write in a basic way or write an introduction like one, two, three, four, and uh, there, there are all the four points and we're done. But it helps you ask the questions, wait, did I do this? Am I doing it properly? Is that where the problem lies? So very simple diagrammatic structures can be helpful too. Which leads to another point, education is not a distraction from your research. It's actually incredibly useful. Uh, it forces you to acquire knowledge. It forces you to create a narrative that makes sense, that can be understood, not just by others, but to yourself uh, as well. It also means having a reaction to what you say, getting a sense of what sticks, what are the questions that emerges, what, what's interesting, what's not. So adopt education as a research tool uh, as well, this attempt of explaining, of conveying information. And importantly, communication is more than just a, a means of research. Do research talking to someone, communicating with something. Uh, we, we can often get into these rabbit holes of topics where we end up talking into the void just to ourselves and hearing our echo and not knowing where to go. Be in conversation with an ongoing topic, with other researchers, with a problem that exists and is developing, with react to something, engage with something, and suddenly what you have to say and the relevance of what you have to say becomes much clearer. And how often are we struck by whether our research is relevant or not after months and months talking about the same thing and losing a sense of actually how special it actually is. So in the, sp the spirit of a communication and dialogue, this is a little bit of what we're doing here. But this is the last of the, um, let's say, my uh, little box of small little tips, or some of those that I would like to share today. The more important one and most illuminating one actually actually comes from somewhere else uh it's just i think it's special to share the example of wittgenstein here because although it's a matter of methodology it emerges as the result of a research process where methodology was frequently a process a problem a research process developed at the epfl this interest i have in intersections of architecture and philosophy and so meeting uh, so to say, this character, Ludwig Wittgenstein, has been fascinating. Uh, he's one of the most notorious, uh, not notorious, sorry, one of the most extraordinary uh, and influential philosophers of the 20th century, especially in analytic philosophy. Uh, he worked in the beginning of the 20th century, mostly in logic and philosophy of language. He's also a person with extraordinary uh, biography, and in his biography is the fact that even though he's a philosopher, he designed and built a house. And that's the story I want to tell you, because in this story, there's an incredible insight for doing a PhD. Now, some context um, about the story and Wittgenstein. This name is more or less known in architecture, but it hasn't really had an impact, in part because how um, uh, difficult it is to actually assimilate, uh, break through uh, what Wittgenstein says, and allow me to share an image of him. Uh, he writes in an extraordinarily simple way, um, reductive way, his early writings, yet because they're so reductive and simplistic, it's very hard to actually make sense of them. But once you get through that barrier, he's someone who has a lot to say about architecture and go figure about uh, PhD research as well. Uh, even if not entirely deliberately. So how does this story start? Let's go to 1918, end of the First World War. Wittgenstein has finished the one and only book that he would publish in his lifetime, the Tractatus Logicus Philosophicus. And after he writes this, he's done with philosophy. He decides he's pretty much said everything he had to say about philosophy. And in a very humble way, he also thinks that that is pretty much all there is to say about philosophy. He's resolved the problem. He's resolved the issue. That's it. And so comes this very commonly known and very misinterpreted 
sentence. At the very end of the book, he says, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must remain silent. And he does. After 1918, he is done with philosophy. He's going to work on all kinds of other things. He's going to work as a gardener. He's mostly going to teach as an elementary school teacher for several uh, years. Um, and uh, while he's doing this, he's also in a very delicate state of mind. And this is important for this story. Again, it's 1918 Austria. It's right after the First World War. The Habsburg Empire collapsed. Austria has been reduced to a fraction of what it was. The monarchy has fallen. All the societal and political um, fabric that was familiar for uh, people at that time in Austria just disappeared. Many of those who came back from the war were struggling. Wittgenstein fought in the, in the First World War. Fun fact, well, not fun, but impressive fact, he wrote most of the Tractatus in the front while fighting in the front. And then he suddenly comes back to this reality that he's not, a, he's not familiar with and struggles deeply for years and years, thinking about suicide and going from task to task, a little job to little job to try to escape this deep cloud in him. But after 1926, um, after an incident with his um, uh, elementary teaching in rural Austria, he decides to quit teaching altogether, and he is at the lowest point of his life. In comes his sister, uh, Margaret Wittgenstein, who at the time uh, had commissioned a house from a family friend, Paul Engelmann, uh, an architect who was actually a disciple of Adolf Floß. Wittgenstein had participated in some of the discussions that, uh, about the house. Um, uh, Margaret had very clear ideas about what she wanted to do uh, and a very strong force upon uh, Paul Engelmann. And so Wittgenstein worked as a bridge, a way of conveying these ideas into architectural form. Well, in 1926, worried about her brother's state of mind, she asks Ludwig, do you want to join Paul Engelmann? Uh, designing the house? Do you want to get involved? Maybe this task will uh, do you some good. Uh, and he immediately accepts the challenge. And in this obsessive, compulsive way, uh, manner of being of his, he takes over the project. And for everyone involved, in the end, the design was his. Just to give you an idea of how obsessive he was, perhaps the most famous uh, anecdote about this project is by the end, when the house was built and it and, uh, was about to be cleaned for um, the family to move into, he decided that actually the living room uh, ceiling had to be raised by three centimeters. And even after the house was built, he played the lottery because it was this one staircase he was not happy with and he wanted the money to change. It. So you can see the kind of obsessive personality and how deeply engaged he got with the project. In many ways, the house is both stereotypical, it resonates with the modern Vienna in the late 1920s, and also idiosyncratic and almost reactionary uh, in, in the goals it had, uh, in the mode of production, instead of, for example, being produced with uh, mass-produced uh, uh, building components, it's very artisanal. Uh, there are a lot of small details that had to be worked over and over again by very specific offices to the down to the millimeter. So not something you would generally associate to um, modernist mass production. Uh, but it, it's hard to even talk about the house because what is it exactly? Is it a work of philosophy? I mean, it is designed by uh, a philosopher after all. But at a moment where he was, uh, he didn't want to think about philosophy, so he was doing something else. And it's not like he was embodying philosophical principles into architecture. He didn't have uh, any philosophical principles for architecture to begin with. So is it a work of architecture? Is that the way we should think about it? Surprisingly, it's one of the least thought ways, uh, approaches of the house. And it's true that it didn't quite stick in the canon of uh, 20th century Vienna. So how do we make sense of the house? 
in a very personal way. And this is Wittgenstein himself who is going to tell us. He had, he, again, he didn't write a lot about philosophy. Engelman didn't write about a, lot, a lot about the house because while writing his memoirs, he passed away before reaching this episode. So there's very little we know about their thoughts about the aftermath. But there's one sentence in the notebooks of Wittgenstein that says something about what he thinks architecture does. Work on philosophy like work in architecture in many respects, is really more work on oneself, one's own conception, on how one sees things and what one expects of them. And this is the insight I want to grab onto and really want to convey to you today. Let's break this apart. First of all, he compares philosophy and architecture in, in what regard? In the way that it builds up a mode of understanding the world, of dealing with the things around us, of a personal conception of things. And it's something that happens not just in the result as it comes about, even if it's a kind of illustration or formulation of that conception, the house is a formulation of that, or the philosophical uh, book or the text or the argument is an articulation of a certain conception of, and a way of seeing things. But he also stresses the process of doing that. It's not philosophy and architecture, it's work on philosophy, like work on architecture. It's the process of doing things. Now, don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean like uh, it doesn't mean that the journey is all that matters. That that's not it. Wittgenstein did publish a book. He did design the house. There is a sense that you are pr pr producing something in the end, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that is where the motivation or the main goal lies. And uh, another important aspect of uh, this quote is the personal dimension of it, the extremely personal dimension of it. It's more work on oneself, one's own conception, on one, how one sees things and what one expects of them. This doesn't mean that when he was doing architecture, he wasn't doing architecture, or as a philosopher, he stopped being a philosopher. All of this was there in the process of building the house, but it wasn't the end goal. These were means that he was using in this personal struggle, in this personal aim, in this finding conceptions and seeing things. It's a reversal of what we usually think. We do not give ourselves away to a predefined process, to philosophy as a whole, to architecture as a whole, but we embrace them as means to solve these very um, deep personal problems that we have, struggles that usually match these fields as well. And isn't this familiar in, in doing a PhD as well? Yes, we see it in architecture. Yes, uh, well, we see it in, in this specific case. Think of how uh, Wittgenstein's sister got him into this process. Why? Because of her concern with his, his personal condition. Think of how architects get involved in a series of projects. Yes, they're commissioned to do projects, but when we look back at their career, there's development, there's a reaction, there's a dialogue, and a certain process of thought, project over project. There's a work being done, a work on oneself, as an architect, but as a person as well. The same thing can be seen in philosophy. On hindsight, we see this process of each individual as well. And we see that in the PhD too. Think about it. What first got you into the PhD program? What motivated you to go into it? Wasn't there kind of burning desire to understand something or a deeply troubled question that you really had to resolve. You wanted to figure it out. You wanted to make sense of or this thing that you absolutely wanted to do. And then you find a framework in which you can work on it. Now, the process of working on your methodology is part of this working on oneself. Uh, determining a method, uh, is as I was as I said in the beginning is not just this given but also a process that uh, is built throughout the process of doing the PhD and especially in something like academia that encompasses your whole life it's not this nine to five job in figuring out this question that you're so passionate about and got you into the PhD program working on this method is not just in the strict sense of something uh, of a procedural matter but a life sense too. What are the what is the way that you're going to shape your life 
to be able to address these questions. And that is a work on yourself too. In the end, what, what this comes down to is next time you're struggling with doing your PhD, uh, with your, your PhD thesis, because you have a problem with method that you can't quite figure out, don't despair. By trying to resolve this issue, you are doing your PhD, uh, not perhaps in the sense of doing your thesis, but in becoming a PhD, doing your doctorate. Give that process the same care and attention that you would the topic that you mean to reach. After all, working on that method is working on an outlook upon things, what we make of them, how we deal with them, and what we get out of them, uh, if anything, because uh, it's necessary to actually reach that goal that you aspire to and got you into the PhD in the first place, but also more importantly, in this life-consuming sense of academia, that this process isn't restricted to the lab, or to the desk, or to the computer, or to the thesis. Crucially, working on one's PhD is also working on oneself. Thank you for your attention.